Welcome to IdeaGen TV, presented globally by Microsoft. We're ecstatic to be here today with two incredible individuals, Alex Goldberg from Ad Astral. Alex, welcome. Thank you so much. And our great colleague as well from Los Angeles today, Maurizio Vecchioni. Maurizio, welcome. Uh, thank you, George. A uh, pleasure being here. You know, it's um, I'm not always in awe. You know, we've been in Washington for a few decades now, and you meet a lot of great people. You really do. You meet so many great people from all different walks of life and all different vantage points. But today is a, is a special day to have you both with us because of the work that you're doing and that you've done and will do in the future, uh, specifically to save lives and change the world. And all the things we talk about at IdeaGen on a constant basis. And I'd like to zero in as we launch into this interview by asking you to just talk a little bit about yourselves for a second, because I think it's important for the global audience to understand who you are. And then we'll launch into some questions that I have that I think will maybe spark some intrigue amongst our global audience. Sure. Um, I'll very quickly say I, I've been a benefit of, uh, beneficiary of being part of five uh, software and technology startup companies two of the earliest unicorns that went uh, IPO for billions of dollars in the late 90s and early 2000s. I've always been a product person. I love talking to crazy inventors and mad scientists and translating what they have into great business problems. And uh, I also worked for the Fortune, a Fortune 500 company for the office of the CTO, flying around the world, uh, lecturing and, and talking about the future of technology. And over the last 10 plus years, I've been an early stage seed investor. And I love company building. I love uh, taking crazy uh, bets on, on new, uh, breakthrough technologies that solve major problems in, in the world. And we'll talk a little more about uh, the latest project and the latest chapter. Fantastic. And Maurizio Vecchione, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, George. Um, well, I am a trained scientist, uh, but I'm also the type of scientist that is also considered an entrepreneur. So I represent a new breed of uh, of um, uh, sort of scientific entrepreneurship that I practice first in my research career and then eventually um, uh, in my corporate building career. I've been responsible to um, building uh, many um, startups, including a few that achieve unicorn status. Um, and uh, really, my life was uh, was a journey, I think, that, um, that went from um, classic scientific discovery to the realization that science has the power to drive uh, not only social change, but to be a solution to many uh, of humanity's most daunting problems. And uh, that journey took me to uh, eventually working with Bill Gates, um, which I did over the last decade. And, um, and in that journey, um, we really sort of tried to institutionalize the idea that science and, and partnerships with the, pub, with the private sector um, uh, done right um, have an enormous catalytic uh, potential um, to address some of humanity's most daunting issues, whether it'll be on the planet and planetary scale issues like climate or whether it's on uh, medicine uh, like human disease. And really, I sort of have dedicated my life to this idea that uh, science and impact can sort of merge together to create uh, incredible opportunities as well as incredible advancement for humanity and ultimately in the context of impact. You know, Maurizio, thank you. Thank you for that description of, of your work and, and the future of your work as well. I think it's, it's remarkable to think about the possibilities when you look at cross-sector collaboration and, and science. And I love the, the notion of a, a, a scientist entrepreneur. I mean, I think that's awesome. And I think we need more of that, obviously. And I think you're a catalyst for that as well, right, Alex? And um, as we look at the world today and we look at the headlines each and every day, I think we all are hearing about ESG. ESG. ESG is a popular thing right now, right? It's sort of the, at the fore. There's certain things that rise to the fore. We have, a, in, you know, and we're in Washington, so we can talk a little bit about a new infrastructure bill that you can say was bipartisan in many ways. And it allowed for uh, electrification. EVs will be coming with charging stations and new roads and bridges and, you know, all of that. 
And so tell us a little bit about why ESG is important to you, Alex, and certainly Maurizio. I know you're, you know, a big fan of ESG. Why is it so important? Maybe I'll start, Maurizio. Uh, uh, sure. Yes. So, so uh, and lead into Maurizio to say the second half of it. Um, but I mean, maybe I'll start with just a personal story. Uh, you know, a year ago, March 17th, I was sitting in New York City, and uh, I think uh, the world kind of changed for everybody. And uh, I certainly had an incredible amount of empathy uh, for all the bartenders, waitresses, uh, people who are working in retail. Uh, you know, there was an incredible shock that went through the entire system as a country. And you know, I, I, I felt incredibly lucky in that I was able to drive off to Massachusetts back to my you know, old, old home where I'd grown up with and get close with family and just try to digest what was going on. And, uh, you know, at the same time, it really felt like everything, you know, a lot of people went through a tremendous amount of change. And I remember taking about a week or two and just uh, my head was spinning uh, and I didn't quite know what to do. And I I, um, I guess I, I'd remembered back to um, a number of the companies I worked for, a number of the innovators I've spoken with over my life, a lot of the engineers I've worked with who are just brilliant problem solvers. And I kept racking my head for different people I knew who might be able to interpret something. I really was inspired at the time. Uh, I, I called it Team Human. Uh, you had people who were mechanical engineers designing new ventilators from scratch. You had people who were thinking about ways of distributing um, uh, some sort of medical capabilities. Uh, I even knew people in New York City who were going back to the old uh, network of people who, who uh, used to weave and, and make clothing and they started making masks from scratch. And it was kind of a really inspiring element of like kind of the homeland or whatnot in reaction to it. And so one of the things I did was I, I kind of recalled back to an old friend of mine, Maurizio, who I'd met about five years earlier. And uh, again, uh, I, I'd spoken about a conference. We, we really hit it off well. We did some work together. I flew out to Seattle several times. And I remember our first conversation, he told me he was uh, running a secret lab for a billionaire. And I thought I'd fallen into a Batman or a Spider-Man movie. And, and it was absolutely incredible uh, to see the work that they were doing and the inspirational work. And I called him up and I said, what do you have metaphorically in the basement that might kind of help the world right now? We're in a really tough time right now, a jam. And uh, with, with the incredible R&D you've done, uh, are there some, some interesting innovations in medical sciences in, in uh, just to help public health and manufacturing that might, we might be able to collaborate on? And it led to a series of conversations uh, that, that sort of led to this partnership and the launch of, uh, of Adastral. I might ask, uh, Maritio, maybe you could uh, mention some of the, uh, the frameworks you think about what an ESG is and how, how you sort of prioritized what you built to date and how we're, we're, we're now thinking about what we want to build uh, and, and, and what we measure by what we mean by uh, ESG itself. Yeah, you know, and again, uh, for me, the journey is equally personal. Um, obviously, the pandemic was um, uh, a, a catalyst, but also was not. It was also the the manifestation of probably the nightmare that I had uh, been worrying about for many, many years. And, and Alex knows this well. And, and George, I think you do too, that you know the, 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 the age of the pandemic that we lived through was, is unfortunately not an unforeseen event. And, uh, and uh, for, for many years, uh, myself and many others have been warning that we were wholly unprepared to deal with a public health emergency of this type and that it was only a matter of time. So when you think about ESG, um, you know, there is this sort of romantic notion that um, impact is important and we should dedicate some resources to, to causes that are good and that will help humanity. And I think that's accelerating in the post-COVID uh, world, not to suggest that the pandemic is finished yet. But, um, but the, you know, from my perspective, I think, uh, I think ESG is much more than that. Um, you know, through my experience with with Bill and the work that we did within within Gates, I can show you a direct correlation between uh, initiatives, including private sector initiatives, companies, products that um, are achieving a high impact in some way, whether it's the E, the S, or the G in ESG, or other forms of impact, um, and financial performance. So, you know, my sort of evolution of thinking around ESG is that ESG is not just a noble thing to do. It's not a charitable thing to do. It's actually a great business strategy to build the trillion dollar companies of tomorrow. And, and I think increasingly 
uh, companies that ignore the opportunities uh, that are represented by um, these sort of impact spaces are actually missing out on an opportunity to sort of uh, build tremendous shareholder value. And the idea of creating shareholder value and creating positive impact are not disconnected. Um, and increasingly, I think the managers of tomorrow and the funders of tomorrow are going to be looking for people that can manage that um, that relationship in a way that um, that ultimately capitalizes on the opportunity. So I'm being very utilitarian in the way I think about ESG. Uh, of course, the social impact is super important, and it's the real reason why I'm doing this. But it is also a great business operating strategy uh, and philosophy to attach the future companies of tomorrow. So. Well, Maurizio, I think that was a great description of because, you know, ESG can be confusing. I mean, you know, we're, we're you know, in the midst of uh, COP26, there's a lot of different priorities and, and the politics around those and all that. And I think prioritizing what is important, that's why we highlighted the infrastructure bill here in the United States as an example of perhaps a, a model that can really help spur jobs, growth, and how companies can participate in that process to be able to um, effectively impact and affect um, the process vis-a-vis -vis ESG, as defined by Alex and Maurizio here today. And I'd like to pivot for a moment here. Um, Maurizio, you and I have had a lot of conversations on this next topic, and it's really focused on moonshots. And I'd like to direct this uh, question to you because you are the moonshot, moonshot guy. You are that person who's worked on so many moonshots. You know, I, I often tell people when I, and I've had the privilege of on many occasions, you know, visiting you in your in the lab that you ran with and for Mr. Gates and all that. My gosh, I mean, talk about contributing to humanity. Talk about, you know, trying to change the game in an authentic, and I'll go a step further, empathetic way. To you, Maurizio, how do you define moonshots? So uh, I think a, a good way to think about it is uh, anything new, especially if it has its roots on fundamental science or research or, or technology, is a trade-off between achieving a certain impact and uh, assuming a certain amount of risk. And so if you were to... Uh, sort of look at things that have a inordinate potential for impact, but are also highly risky. And so they're not typically the kind of things that people try because it might feel like it's too daunting. Um, I would say the high risk, high reward opportunities is what I would be defining as moonshots. Now, there is a close relative to that which is the opposite of moonshots. But unfortunately, a lot of um, startup activity and, and um, uh, folks that are uh, um, attempting to do something new fall into. And that would be things that are high risk, but are not necessarily high impact. And so distinguishing between high risk, high impact, which are moonshots worth doing with, um, low impact, high risk, which are moonshot not worth doing, uh, is really, I think, an art. And I think it is the, it is the crux of uh, how to be effective in sort of building, for lack of better words, a moonshot factory. Um, and somewhere in there, you have to understand the problems that you're trying to solve in order to assess both the risk and the impact opportunity. And I'm always amazed by how many uh, so-called moonshots uh, come into being where the folks driving the moonshot don't actually understand the metric for success, the metric for impact, or what the problem definition actually is. And so in a lot of the work that Alex and I are setting out to do, uh, and in a lot of the work that I've done historically, understanding the problem and understanding a sort of impact versus risk profile becomes the critical strategies before you can make meaningful investments and ultimately devise meaningful solutions. And Maybe I could add something? Please. Uh, there's an old Winston Churchill quote, success is going from one failure to the next with no loss of enthusiasm. 
And I, th I think um, when, when we think about uh, taking very high risk bets that could pay off 200 or 1,000 to one, um, the key is to do a lot of them and, uh, and to aim for the stars essentially. And so I, I think what I've really been struck by in the methodology that Maurizio and his team have perfected over time is to set very concrete targets that require an interdisciplinary way of thinking. And uh, to the extent you can say, I want to achieve X, um, and uh, draw in chemists, physicists, virologists, mechanical engineers, and come up with incredible solutions that no individual discipline could possibly do unto themselves, I think has been very inspiring for me to watch it in, in motion. That's right. And, and I'd like to follow up with that, Mauricio, as well on the pandemic. So the pandemic, you know, look, we're two years in. I remember saluting my wife on New Year's in 2020 and saying, my gosh, we have a decade to achieve the global goals. Exciting. And here we are on this on this ride that we've all been on. It's just a terrible thing that we've all experienced with having lost 700,000 people and on and on. Um, but I want to ask the question, the obvious question, which is, has the pandemic accelerated or decelerated the opportunities to achieve these moonshots? It's interesting. Um, you know, the pandemic looks different in different parts of the world. You know, you mentioned the 700,000 people um, that we lost in, in this country. Well, there are millions of people that we lost globally. And, uh, you know, some of the biggest population centers in the world uh, today, unfortunately, don't have the access to vaccines or other public health interventions to allow them to even positively think about uh, exiting the pandemic. And unfortunately, I think one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is that, you know, disease knows no border. And, and so we are, you know, we're in this boat at the planetary level uh, altogether and a failure in public health in any one place is ultimately going to uh, drive a failure uh, everywhere else. You know, we, we talk about the Delta variant and we don't talk about the fact that the genetic pressure that created that mutation was really coming out of places where vaccination rates were so low that, um, that um, you know, it caused essentially that mutation to occur. So, you know, without wanting to get political, I think the pandemic has had different um, uh, pressures and different solutions in different parts of the world. What I do think the pandemic has shown is that when confronted with a problem, uh, both as humanity and as individual, including individual companies, um, there, there is an incredible amount of ingenuity that can really accelerate the timelines that are normally associated with uh, technical or scientific developments and solution. Just think of the speed at which the vaccines were, were developed and brought together. And by the way, that didn't happen in a vacuum. There was lots of research in areas like mRNA that, that essentially allowed the platform to do an accelerated effort in partnership with government, in partnership with, with um, uh, uh, the nonprofit sector, in partnership with the clinical sector, in partnership with uh, the private sector. So I do think that the pandemic is teaching us how to behave against some of these global problems with, uh, with greater agility, and that is facilitating moonshot thinking. And, uh, you know, if you had told uh, a pharmaceutical executive in 2018 or even 2019 that a vaccine could become real and distributed at the scale that has been distributed, um, in, in the space of 12 to 18 months, uh, it would have been looked at as science fiction. And, um, and that all happened as a result of the pressure of the pandemic. Um, you know, on the flip side, funding priorities in so many areas has been sort of changed. Um, and uh, and uh, memories tend to be short in terms of learning lessons. Um, and, uh, and some of the political discourse is creating more division than unity in addressing some of these global uh, problems, not just in this country. So, so, so there are some detractors to that, but I think all in all in balance, I'm very optimistic that, um, 
that as a global village, uh, we are seeing stepped up appetite for moonshot thinking and for taking these sort of global issues very seriously and to some extent understanding that global is actually local. You know, Maurizio, you you really nailed it there, as always, and and I and, and you inspire us, and you've inspired us here today, and you'll inspire the millions of people that will see this on DHN TV. I think there's an opportunity uh, to take what you've said and continue on and to connect these dots, right, Alex, to be able to continue to change the world. It's not easy, but it's possible, yeah. right? Thank you so much for hosting. And again, IdeaGen has been such a phenomenal place to convene great minds from different disciplines. You know, I think uh, we're, we're just privileged to be participant and very privileged to have you as a key advisor for us. And um, as we think about uh, uh, the infrastructure bill, we think about key areas of needs in health and in climate and investing in those areas. We believe this for-profit uh, vehicle this notion of incubating and launching new companies and a venture fund behind it is going to be extraordinarily good for the world from a social impact perspective and extraordinarily profitable as a, a new category uh, of uh, investment. As Maurizio said a few minutes ago, we firmly believe the next trillion dollar company may not have been founded yet and is probably in this sector. Incredible. What is your call to action to those watching today? Oh, I think uh, think big. I I. I, I you know, what's the worst that could happen? It's, it's a very American exceptionalism story. You know, this idea that, um, you know, we, we often are constrained by our, our notions of failure. And I think, um, you know, a lot of other countries, I'll, I'll, let's just say in Japan, if one were to have a, a big failure in the middle of one career, one might be sent off to a remote office somewhere. I invested in a uh, French-based company and the CEO was phenomenal. He told me that if it failed, his, his brother, his cousin, they'd all be looked down upon by their community. And he didn't care. He really wanted to do something big. And I was so psyched for him. But uh, something that's so phen phenomenal about um, sort of the American entrepreneurial culture is uh, this idea of taking really big bets. And if it doesn't work, it's a great experience. You move on to your next one. Wow. Maurizio, you have the final word. Well, I, I'll trigger on what Alex said. You know, in science, failure is just a, it's just a learning lesson. Uh, and I think the great entrepreneurs and the great companies of tomorrow are going to be those that might not have the perfect plan on day one, but uh, through a certain amount of learning and a certain amount of um, uh, agility are able to sort of pivot and learn from their, quote, failures so that they can ultimately uh, become those uh, great success stories that deliver the high impact. So, you know, if you are not prepared to fail, you can't really do moonshot thinking. And if you can't do really moonshot thinking, you can't um, you can't drive the kind of change that moonshot uh, uh, imply. So uh, failure is good. Uh, some people are saying you need to learn how to fail fast. Uh, sometimes that's not entirely possible, but to make sure the failure becomes a stepping stone to a success is, is really sort of uh, our call to action. And it is the key ingredient if you're going to be trying moonshots. And I think that's the part you need to add is you need to be able to then pivot to do something to, to achieve the moonshot. I love that. Maurizio Vecchione, Alex Goldberg, thank you so very much.